It is my great honor, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, the Honorable Lloyd Carmeier. Justice. Thank you, Senator Dillard. <clears throat> and I want, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to add my thanks to Molly and Melanie for their great renditions of two very difficult songs to sing. It's just the way I would have done it. I also want you to know that I ask our string quartet to stay and play the entire evening rather than have you listen to this, to me or anybody else, but they left, so you're, gonna, you're kind of stuck with us. So on behalf of the Supreme Court of Illinois, I want to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you for being here tonight. And I want to express our thanks to John Lupton and to the Illinois Supreme Court Historic Preservation Commission, here and after the commission. It's a pretty big handle, as you can see. They are our hosts for this great celebration tonight for the 200 years of celebrating the judiciary in the state of Illinois. And they have planned a very full and entertaining evening for us, including trying to work in dinner among all of these speeches and the awards presentation. And I'm going to leave it to Senator Dix, uh, Dirksen, not Dixon, <laughs> crossed the line there a little bit, didn't I? Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to leave it to our Master of Ceremonies to introduce the members of the Commission here tonight. Um, Senator Dixon, Dirksen is our, is our uh, it stuck with me, didn't it? Is our uh, MC, and he will keep the program moving, at least after I sit down. <clears throat> but I do want to introduce my colleagues on the Supreme Court that are here tonight. And I'm going to start, as we always do, by seniority, and of course that means it's probably the oldest guy on the court. Justice Robert Thomas and his wife, Maggie. <laughs> Justice Tom Kilbride, his wife, Mary, is teaching. <clears throat> Justice Rita B. Garman. I don't know if you've seen the movie at RBG, but it's, it's about her. <laughs> don't be confused. And if I weren't standing here, I would be next. I'm Lloyd Carmeier, and my wife, Mary, is over here. <laughs> Justice Ann Burke and her husband, Ed. <laughs> Justice Mary Jane Tice and her husband, John. I'm always tempted to say John Tice after that because she always calls him John Tice. I don't know why, but she does. And our newest Justice, P. Scott Neville Jr. and his wife, Sharon. <laughs> and lest you think that we on the court do our work without any help, uh, we not only have law clerks and staff in Springfield, we have the uh, Supreme Court clerk Carolyn Grosball, who is here this evening with her husband, Alan. And they're from that nice little town of Petersburg where they have the Hand of Fate Brewery. I don't know why I know that, but I do. Uh, Marcia Meese, the Director of the Administrative Office of Illinois Courts, is here tonight. Marcia. Jacob Jost, Jacob Jost, our court reporter of decisions, and his wife, Rhea, in the back of the room. And Jeff Helsick and his wife, Mandy, our uh, Supreme Court librarian, Jeff. I'd also like to note that uh, Justices Burke and Garman also served as our court's liaison to the commission. We're also very pleased tonight that retired Chief Justice Ben Miller of the Illinois Supreme Court is here. Justice Miller. Thank you. I want to say it's truly a privilege for me to be here tonight as the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court as we gather to um, observe the 200th anniversary of the appointment 
of the Court's first four members on October 9, 1818. I want to clarify one thing. I was not one of them. <laughs> but as it turns out, I have a unique connection to that first court. As you may know, if you read some of John Lupton's excellent materials on the court and the court's history, the very first session of the court conducted by a member of the Illinois Supreme Court took place in a little community called Covington in Washington County, where Justice John Reynolds, one of the first four, presided as part of his duties when Supreme Court justices also rode the circuit. I grew up in Covington. In my youth, Covington consisted of a Lutheran church, the one-room schoolhouse that I attended, and a combination store and tavern, which was closed during church services but opened immediately afterwards. Covington, as I said, is in Washington County, where I grew up. I practiced law. I became the resident, the resident circuit judge, only one from the county, and where I now have my Supreme Court chambers. But there's even a closer connection to the courthouse where Justice Reynolds convened that first session of court because it was located on the very land that my father farmed from about 1946 until 1970s. Around the time of that first court session in early 1819, Covington was actually being considered for the location of the new state capital. It was to be moved from Kaskaskia, which was in the what is now the present Randolph County of Illinois, uh, to a more central part of the state. And if I have it here, I want to read part of the resolution that was introduced in the legislature. The resolution basically said, Covington should be the new capital because it was described as being near the center of Illinois population, located on the Kaskaskia River, and so located that all overland roads in the whole area must inevitably pass through this town. As I was growing up, when my dad was farming that ground, there were still a couple of trees, some mounds there for the foundations of the old courthouse. It included the brick and the, um, the limestone for the foundation, marking the original site of that 1818 courthouse. So in 2005, shortly after I was elected to the Supreme Court, I took my staff down there to uh, collect some artifacts. What we found was the trees were gone, the mounds were gone, but there were still a few stones, a few bricks, and the entire ground area had a reddish cast where the old bricks had disintegrated. I picked up a few of those bricks and stones, and I gave some to be displayed at the Washington County Courthouse in Nashville, and some I still keep in my official chambers in Nashville. So now you're probably wondering, what happened to that resolution to move the capital to Covington? It failed. Can you believe that? It was so situated that almost everybody had passed through Covington. We lost that vote to Vandalia. So the capital moved in 1820 from Kaskaskia to uh, Vandalia, Illinois. And it remained there until some fellow named Lincoln became instrumental in moving the capital to Springfield. And so we're here tonight in Springfield, not in Covington. But I want to tell you, Covington still has a Lutheran church, but the store and tavern are closed, and my old one-room schoolhouse is now the uh, Covington Town Hall. But I still have my box of rocks. It's a nice reminder of my family, my farm, and the continuity of the court system that began in Covington in Washington County and has continued over the past two centuries here in Illinois. Now, as I turn this podium back over to Senator Dillard, I join with all of you in anticipating um, the keynote address from Scott Turow, seeing history on trial, the video, and welcoming the recipients of the George Layton Award. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Justice. Uh, I am State Senator, former State Senator, Kirk Dillard from uh, DuPage County. Wheaton is our wonderful county seat. And uh, 
I currently serve as the chairman of the Regional Transportation Authority in Chicago, uh, which I reminded Scott Terrell that some of his novels were written on one of our metro trains, so uh, they're, they're wonderful and they produce great things. Um, I'm also a partner at the law firm of Lock Lord in Chicago, but most importantly, I'm a proud member of the Historic Preservation Commission uh, of the Supreme Court. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, a number of appellate justices whom have joined us this evening. Um, we'll uh, wait for applause until I've introduced them all, um, but Justice Shelvin Hall is here, Justice Thomas Harris, and you can all stand up if you want. Uh, we'll all applaud you at the end. Um, Justice Mary Rochford, uh, Justice, I saw her, uh, Aurelio Puchinski is here, and Justice, uh, Justice Joy Cunningham, Justice Mary Shostak is here, uh, Justice Terry Lavin or Terrence Lavin, um, Justice Mary Ann Mason, and Justice uh, Jesse uh, Ruiz. Uh, uh, Reyes. Um, you all here? Thank you all for being here tonight. There's Justice Grace. There are a good number of circuit judges that have joined us uh, this evening as well, and we thank you and uh, we thank you for honoring us this evening by being here as well and for your service every day uh, around the, our courthouses. Um, I believe Illinois House member uh, Barbara Flynn Curry and uh, Representative Tim Butler are here. They serve as co-chairs of the Illinois Bicentennial Commission. Um, hi, Representative. And if Barbara's here, Barbara, it's uh, always great to, to be with you, uh, Representative uh, Curry. Um, Stuart Lane, I saw Stuart here. He's the executive director of the Illinois Bicentennial Commission and has just done a magnificent job. Thank you so much, Stuart. <laughs> there are no former uh, colleagues of mine from the uh, state senate. Uh, but uh, we do have a number of us retirees. Um, Senator David Luchtefeld, who uh, is here from Oakville, Illinois, uh, a childhood friend of Chief Justice Carmeier, by the way, and my former uh, compadre and office mate in the State Senate, um, Senator Howard Brookins Sr., and uh, myself, Senator Kirk Dillard. Help, Senator Brookins, nice to see you, sir. And then, um, as Justice Carmeier said, um, a big thanks to the commissioners. Um, Pauline Montgomery is here. Um, James Morphew. Jim Morphew, I saw you from Springfield here tonight. Um, Joe Power, I saw back here. Joe, thank you for your service. Um, William Quinlan, uh, thank you. Um, Bill Roberts uh, from Springfield as a commissioner. Um, Marsha Meese, who also serves as, very importantly, the executive director of the administrative office of the Illinois Courts, was on the commission as well. Um, former Governor Jim Thompson has been the chair of the commission. Um, he sends his deep regrets. Um, Governor Thompson has worked tirelessly uh, with John Lupton, um, Justice Burke, Justice uh, um, Carmeier, and all the justices, and Rita Garman, who was the chair, uh, chief justice for so long. Um, and he extends his apologies for not being here tonight. Everybody knows Governor Thompson is a tremendous, tremendous lover of history, uh, and he sends his deepest apologies for not being here tonight, but he's here in spirit. I also want to introduce two very important former commissioners. Um, Mike McLean uh, is here. I saw Mike from Quincy uh, is here tonight, and also Kim Fox. Uh, Kim has been instrumental in fundraising. Uh, we run a shoestring operation, uh, and Kim and Mike, thank you so much. You know, that, I was thinking about that as I sat there, and you know, certainly it's the Preservation Commission and its members. Um, it's the liaisons, Chief Ju or Justice Garman and Justice Burke, um, John Lupton, our executive director. Uh, you know, they have all been responsible for tonight. But I'd like to go back just a little bit further than that, and it's when I was Chief Justice from 05 to 08, and I noticed that the murals in the uh, Supreme Court needed restoring and we needed a humidification system. And I thought I needed someone with a little bit of energy and maybe who knew a few people um, to take over that project. And that's just about when Ann Burke um, came to the court. So I asked Ann if she could work on finding some money for us to restore the murals and a humidification system. 
And lo and behold, we have a historic Preservation Commission, and I think it's long overdue that we give Ann Burke, Justice Ann Burke, a round of applause. Ed, my wife and I often talk about that woman, your wife, has more energy than anyone that we know. And uh, since we're with her down here for five months out of the year, I found that one Valium at 11 o'clock in her water helps just a tad. So. All right. We gather tonight to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Illinois judiciary. We will hear about and celebrate the ways that the judges and lawyers of this state have contributed positively to the political and cultural identity of this state, about how the history of Illinois, and dare I say the history of this nation, have been shaped by the legal and jurisprudential insights birthed within our borders, and about how the heroic legacy of the last two centuries, as great as it is, will almost certainly be eclipsed in the decades and centuries to come. And to assist us in this endeavor, we have retained the services of a world-renowned fiction writer. <laughs> Scott Turo is an Illinois native who was educated at New Trier High School, Amherst College, and Harvard Law School. In fact, the last time Scott and I were together at a memorial for Justice Seymour Simon, Scott began his remarks with a story about how when he was just 14 years old, his parents ruined his life. Yes, ruined his life. Sadly, it's an all too common story. A young man born in Chicago, raised in the streets of the city, hardened by the north side neighborhoods he called home, and thoughtlessly transplanted to the gritty and cold reality known as Winnetka. <laughs> May we all have our lives ruined by moving to Winnetka. My task tonight is to introduce Scott Turow, but Scott needs no introduction. He is the author of 12 best-selling books, including the literary thrillers Presumed Innocent, The Burden of Proof, and Reversible Errors, all of which were made into successful feature films. His autobiographical book, 1L, tells the story of Scott's experience as a first-year Harvard Law student. And that book continues to inspire, frighten, and in many cases dissuade thousands upon thousands of potential law students to this day. He has been on the cover of Time Magazine, which in 1999 named presumed injuries, personal injuries rather, the best novel of the year. And he is the recipient of numerous literary awards, including the Silver Dagger Award of the British Crime Writers Association. In 2003, he received the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights 2003 Book Award for his nonfiction book, Ultimate Punishment, A Lawyer's Reflections on Dealing with the Death Penalty. And in 2000, he was named a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois and received the Order of Lincoln, which is the highest award given by the state of Illinois. But Scott is not just a writer. As prolific as he has been, Scott has also maintained a successful and high profile presence in the law. From 1978 through 1986, he served as an assistant United States attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, and he is currently a partner with one of the world's largest firms, Denton's, where he dedicates much of his practice to pro bono criminal defense work. He is a member of the Illinois Executive Ethics Commission, of which he was the first chair, and he served formerly as a member of the Illinois Commission on Capital Punishment. Scott is a true Illinois treasure, and we are fortunate indeed to have him with us tonight. He has written novels about judicial corruption, miscarriages of justice, and attorney misconduct, and he has prosecuted judges and other high-ranking law enforcement officials, including a former Illinois Attorney General. And knowing all of this, we chose him to speak to us about the history 
and legacy of the Illinois judiciary. Honestly, I can't think of a better choice. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Scott Turow. Well, my, my thanks to uh, Justice Thomas for lowering expectations so effectively. Uh, I am, as someone who has um, practiced law in this state uh, for 40 years, uh, truly uh, honored uh, to be here and uh, to celebrate the justices of our Supreme Court, the other judges who are in this room who are very much truly the luminaries and honorees this evening. Uh, but although I am humbled and honored, uh, it is certainly true, given recent events in Washington, D.C., that it is a challenging time uh, for a speaker who has to talk about the state of the judiciary uh, as his general topic. Uh, our dear friend, Justice Ann Burke, and I have engaged for years in a gentle debate <clears throat> about whether the needs of a democracy and an independent judiciary are better served by a system of elected judges, as we have here in Illinois, or the federal system with which I grew up as an assistant U.S. attorney in which judges are appointed for life subject to the advice and consent of the Senate. Uh, a system, by the way, I note parenthetically, which was pretty much the system here in Illinois originally in 1818, before it was changed in 1848. But at any rate, looking at what's gone on in Washington the last couple of weeks, I have to look at our friend Justice Burke and say, well, okay, you have a point. Um, <laughs> g given the setting, um, I, it might be wise to remember how Lincoln dealt with contentiousness. Uh, as we know, thanks to Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, Lincoln chose a cabinet full of his political rivals many of whom were reluctant to accept his leadership. He once sent a delegation with a request from him to uh, Edwin Stanton, his Secretary of War, and the delegation returned, reporting that Stanton had said, if Lincoln said that, then he is a fool. And Lincoln reportedly answered, I better go talk this over with Stanton. He's usually right. So uh, Lincoln also liked to tell the story of a fellow who placed his stovepipe hat on a seat in the theater and did not notice when a man approached and without looking behind himself, sat down on the chapeau. The uh, hat owner, uh, rather than resorting to fisticuffs, is reported to have said by Lincoln, sir, I could have told you that the hat wouldn't have fit before you tried it on. Uh, no amount of joking, though, can obscure the fact that uh, it is a moment of peril for the judiciary uh, because the recent fights seem to present the U.S. Supreme Court uh, and, by extension, all of our courts, uh, including the courts we celebrate tonight here in Illinois and the Illinois Supreme Court, um, they seem to be presented to the public as the instruments of naked partisan wrath. And I do not want to dismiss the dangers. Uh, there is a very respectable argument that the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in the Dred Scott case in 1857 actually was the principal cause of the Civil War, uh, through which Lincoln, of course, so bravely guided us. Dred Scott was born a slave, but had lived in free states, including Illinois. Uh, and sued for his freedom on that basis. The Supreme Court in 1857 ruled not only for Scott's owners, but then said that slaves could never become citizens of the United States, and further, that it was unconstitutional for Congress to prohibit slavery in any state as it had done through the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise was outlawed as a result, and the unwisdom of the U.S. Supreme Court put our nation on the path to war. So the stakes in a democracy are always high, but I am one of those people who, particularly heading into older age, tends to accept the wisdom of Dr. King's remark 
that the arc of history bends toward justice. Uh, one problem, frankly, in our country is that most people learn next to nothing about history in our schools these days. And so at a time like the present, uh, it seems that things have never been worse because, frankly, many people have a very limited knowledge of what actually happened in the past. But we have been far through far worse with our courts. Uh, after the Civil War, Congress, as it has every right to do constitutionally, uh, expanded the membership of the U.S. Supreme Court a number of times to prevent the court from adhering to Dred Scott and thus from overruling Reconstruction. In the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the Supreme Court was directly antagonistic to the popular movements that had led to labor laws and the growth of unions. They had actually said in one case that even child labor laws were unconstitutional. Uh, and of course, as a result, ended up in a direct confrontation with President Roosevelt. And I haven't had the time to research this, but I suspect that the change here in Illinois in 1848 from lifetime appointment to election of justices uh, did not take place against a background of widespread approval of what the court was doing at that period of time. Um, in fact, one does not really have to go back very far <clears throat> to see that popular respect for the judiciary can actually survive um, decisions that can be regarded as overtly political. And with that, I'm thinking in particular about the Supreme Court's decision in Bush versus Gore, where our 2000 presidential election was essentially decided by polling the nine justices of the Supreme Court. The jurisprudence was probably suspect. The court did not adhere to its own longstanding rule about deferring uh, to state Supreme Courts and in interpreting a state's own law. Um, the application of the Equal Protection Clause in that case has probably never been repeated. And candidly, I really can't imagine that the nine justices voted as to the ultimate result in any one of them voted differently than they had in the ballot box in the voting booth. And yet, uh, there was not an insurrection. Americans realized that it was an impossibly close election. Somebody had to win. Uh, the mood of discontent was somewhat abated when major news organizations got access to the Florida ballots and proceeded with a, with a vote count that the Supreme Court had barred and determined that George W. Bush would have won after all, although the Chicago Tribune questioned that result. Uh, and history quickly healed the divide because of the paramount need for national unity that was created after the attacks of 9-11. I actually don't think that the point that we are at now, where there is such intense public attention on the role of the courts and what they do, um, I, I actually think it's a good thing, not a bad thing, uh, for anybody who's concerned about the vitality of a democracy. Um, law, of course, is an arcane subject as far as most citizens are concerned. Uh, and so, to some extent, our courts have always been able to operate behind uh, a veil of popular ignorance. And as Americans become better educated, as information circulates uh, at lightning speed as it does, more and more citizens are aware of the immense consequences of what happens in our courts. Um, but a well-informed electorate is never a bad thing for a democracy, even if judges from time to time might often prefer let, that they work with less attention. It is certainly true that in the last 50 years, uh, our courts have plunged themselves into controversies by dealing with profound questions that implicate personal values, abortion, surrogate motherhood, assisted suicide, the right of persons to love whom they choose. Uh, but the historical forces that put us in that position are ones that I personally approve of. Uh, in the father knows best world of the 1950s in which I grew up, uh, it would have been unthinkable, frankly, for our courts to address those kinds of questions. Um, those matters were, at that time, reserved more likely to the realm of religion, not law. 
uh, in post-World War II America where we wanted to be a national melting pot, it was implicit that there could be only one view of such questions. Uh, but in a country that has come in the last 50 years to much more openly prize its diversity, it's impossible to elevate uh, the answers of any one religious group to the status of law. The courts have stepped in because they are our constitutionally recognized system for deciding these matters. We may not all like the answers that they give, but they are coming out of a system which, by virtue of our citizenship, uh, a system to which we all belong and belong as equals. My most extended effort in my fiction to imagine what it's like to be a judge came in a novella that I published in 2006 called Limitations. The novella was first serialized in the New York Times Magazine in 2005 and was briefly celebrated because it ran at the same time as the Duke lacrosse case, which some of you may remember. The, that case was in the news. But its prescience has not proven to be time limited and limitations has been much in my mind in the last few weeks. Uh, and frankly those of many readers who have written to me for reasons that you will soon understand as I describe the story. The protagonist of limitations is a state appellate court judge named George Mason who uh, the, through a long series of begats, the, um, the heir of one of the signers of the Constitution, he finds himself the deciding vote in a case on appeal before him and two of his colleagues. And I have to say, I think of George as a very good judge. The case he is hearing concerns the sexual assault conviction of four young men. Four years before, these young men, all high school hockey players, had celebrated an important victory by partying far into the night at the house of one of the player's absent parents. A 15-year-old girl, Mindy De Boyer, had attended the party, drunk far too much, and passed out, at which time the defendants had taken the opportunity to have sex with the unconscious young woman. To make matters even more outrageous, one of the four had videotaped the whole event. When she awoke, Mindy De Boyer, a sexual novice, didn't know what had happened, certainly had no desire to tell anybody that at the age of 15, that at the age of 15, she had passed out drunk at a party. Mindy, in fact, and the four defendants all went on with their lives, all graduated high school, all went to college. The crime would have remained forever undisclosed, except that one of the four young men could not resist entertaining his fraternity brothers at college with the videotape. Alas for him, one of those fraternity members was also a friend of Mindy De Boyer's. The police were informed, the videotape was seized, and all four boys were prosecuted four years later after the initial event. The problem, though, that the statute of limitations on sexual assault in my imaginary Kindle County, just as is the case, just as is the case in Illinois, is ordinarily three years. And two different exceptions to the limitations period in my novella proved to be in conflict with one another. By one, the prosecution is lawful. By the other, it is time barred. The legal issues are thorny enough, but George, my hero, finds his decision making complicated by the memory of an event he has largely forgotten. Forty years before, George had his sexual initiation in his freshman college dorm at the University of Virginia with a young woman who had become impossibly drunk. In a mood of despair because she had just flunked out of a neighboring school and because she was very, very, very drunk, the young woman had crawled into a refrigerator box in the dormitory hallways where she had sex with several of the dorm's freshman males, including, alas, George. By the mores of 1969, I suspect most juries and most prosecutors and most men would have said that the young woman's behavior constituted consent. But in looking back, 
George today has no doubt about what judgment the law would render. And thus he faces the question of whether to affirm these boys' convictions very much in mind of the fact that he himself is far, far, far from being without sin. He is actually so torn by the case that he asks his clerk to prepare two different drafts for him, one affirming, one reversing. I now engage in the time-honored uh, practice of novelists and quote myself. Both drafts make sense naturally. There is no analytic trick he learned in law school or since that allows him to pick one or the other apart. For a century and a half, legal education has been focused on the reading of opinions of judges like George who sit in courts of review. In his day, the professors discussed these decisions just as they would now in terms of the policy concerns, the political views, the jurisprudential beliefs that drove them. After holding this job for nearly a decade, he regards much of what he was taught as romantic, if not completely wrong. Most of the time, no matter what your political or philosophical, philosophical stripes, whether you like the law or not, you find that your decision feels preordained. Even when you can imagine a route to another result, loyalty to the institution of the law and more particularly to other judges, good women and men who've sat where you sit and who've done their level best to decide similar cases requires you to follow the same path they've trod. The discretion his professors talked about exists only on the margins in no better than three or four cases a term. I, I won't tell you the end of the story or the judgments that George makes of himself, because I'm here talking about the judiciary, not sexual mores. Um, I will confess that as I have grown older, uh, as I've practiced law longer and longer, my respect for process as the linchpin of judicial uh, decision making has increased. Adherence to precedent, respecting legislative decisions, following procedures, accepting the plain meaning of the law, and deciding cases on the narrowest possible grounds still seem to me uh, the right way for judges to do their jobs. And as George's monologue with himself illustrates, it is in point of fact the way most judges in fact do their jobs. To illustrate that, uh, I want to end by talking about uh, one Illinois Supreme Court case which emphasizes the complex responsibilities of a truly independent judiciary. Everybody here knows that our state has been gripped by a profound and continuing financial crisis. One problem, not the only problem, but one problem is state pension contributions. And in 2013, a bill passed the General Assembly with bipartisan support. Passed the Senate 30 to 24, it passed the House 62 to 53, clear majorities in both bodies. Among other things, the bill would have cur curtailed future cost of living increases for pensioners, raised the retirement age for younger state workers, and capped the pensions of those uh, pensioners with the highest salaries. I will tell you right now uh, that if I were writing on a blank slate, understanding how perilous the financial circumstances of the state are, that I probably would have voted for the bill uh, if I were a legislator, even though I am deeply sympathetic to the state workers who have worked for de decades with expectations based on the law that was about to be changed by this legislation. The problem, of course, was that the legislators were not writing on a blank slate. The Illinois Constitution says plainly that pension benefits, quote, shall not be diminished or impaired. Um, now, I suspect that some members of our Supreme Court 
thought that the law in question is a matter of economic policy for the state, that as economic policy, it was probably wise. But the justices of the Illinois Supreme Court nonetheless were unanimous in striking down the law. The fact was that no amount of lawyerly dancing could change the plain meaning of the words of our Constitution. Indeed, my memory of the case is that the state didn't even bother arguing that, uh, and instead tried to justify the law under the emergency powers of the state. Uh, and as a result, Chief Justice Carmeier uh, wrote in his opinion, crisis is not an excuse to abandon the rule of law. It is a summons to defend it. It is that combination of courage and independence and restraint that I believe most Americans hope for from our courts. And so long as that is applied across the country, as it was applied here in Illinois in that case and so many others, our courts and our democracy will remain strong. Thank you all. Thank you, Scott, for that uh, insightful and inspiring, inspiring speech. It was great. You keep writing those novels on the mass transit system of Chicago. Um, I want to, uh, before uh, we uh, get on to introduce the uh, history on trial video, uh, I want to say thank you to one other uh, uh, Justice of the Appellate Court that is here. Justice Marianne McBride is here. Uh, Justice McBride, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening. In the year 2011, the Commission partnered with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum to produce the retrial of Mary Surratt. The success of this first production led to the performances in 2012 of the Insanity Retrial of Mary Todd Lincoln, in 2013 for the habeas corpus hearings of Joseph Smith, and in 2015 uh, for the Alton School Cases. Uh, the following video, which we're going to view, uh, is a highlight of the history on trial series, as well as providing some background about the commission. I want to thank the uh, Foxhole Creative in Chicago for all their work on producing this video, uh, and let's take a peek if we can. The Supreme Court Historic Preservation Commission was created by an act of the legislature in 2007. I talked to Justice Garman and I talked to my colleagues on the court and I said, I think we're going to need something more. So that's when we came up with the historic preservation idea. We had all three branches of government, you know, agree that there should be a historical component to the Illinois Supreme Court. A vehicle such as the commission allows us the opportunity to educate school children, college students, members of the bar, the public at large. Not only the public, but the legal profession uh, about the workings of the court, about civics, history, and most importantly, the rule of law. The Historic Preservation Commission is always concerned about the relevancy of the law now. When we first started the History on Trial project, what we wanted to do was take a, a modern public policy issue and use history to bring that uh, issue up to the present day. I think that the history on trial mechanism does a beautiful job of being able to uh, create a forum for dialogue like this. These trials are dramatic presentations of old cases as seen through new law. And so the Mary Todd Lincoln case showed us how mental health issues have evolved. In 1875, Robert Todd Lincoln the sole surviving son of the late President Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary Todd Lincoln attempted to commit his mother to an asylum on charges of insanity. She had been spending money wildly, um, acting erratically, and Robert Lincoln was afraid that she was going to spend all of her money on charlatans who were, who were convincing her that she could speak to her deceased husband and deceased children. When Mary Todd Lincoln was found insane under the 1875 Lunatic Act and what it is today, 
looks a lot different. As a matter of fact, under our trial, she was found mentally ill, but not sufficiently so that she would have had to be um, involuntarily committed. It was about mental illness, uh, something which is obviously uh, a topic today, but you also could see the uh, the, the evolution and uh, the progress that we've made. This is an education project. So the State Board of Education partnered with our people to put into a curriculum for middle school and high school children about mental health. After President Lincoln's assassination, Mary Surratt was taken into custody and accused of participating in the conspiracy. She was tried by a military tribunal where she was not given the opportunity to testify. With the help from the commission and, and other wonderful organizations, we did a program in Springfield, we did one in Chicago. We had lawyers um, involved. We had uh, responders for the audience. We would have audience participation to decide if that case were presented to a jury today, what kind of a decision would be made. The contemporary legal issue reflected in the Mary Surratt case is really um, the, the rule of law. And the, the larger issue is whether um, the military has a right to try civilians. The issues that the trial raises in terms of the death penalty, which we are still debating today. Uh, the issues of treason. What is treason? It's a subject that we have never escaped and we will continue to deal with. Um, thirdly, the role of women in society. There could be nothing more current than those issues. In the case of United States versus Mary Surratt, we find her. Unfortunately, Mary Surratt was hanged. <laughs> when we did the habeas corpus trials of Joseph Smith, now Joseph Smith was the Mormon prophet who is considered the founder and was the leader of the Mormon church at that time. And they were headquartered in Nauvoo, Illinois. And Joseph Smith was able to effectively use the writ of habeas corpus to, to extricate himself from essentially what was a trumped up charge. Joseph Smith was indicted for the attempted murder of the Missouri governor. And so the state of Missouri wanted to extradite him knowing that he was in Illinois. Um, so he was jailed. Um, and then he sued for a writ of habeas corpus to free himself. Habeas corpus, to understand exactly what it is, in Latin it means to have the body. Meaning, once someone gets arrested, there has to be a mechanism to challenge that arrest. It is basically a right to have one's arrest looked at to determine whether it was proper. We coordinated with uh, DePaul University Theater School and they were instrumental in bringing in the script writing, the um, actors, uh, basically the entire production. We invited our colleagues from Utah to come and participate. And as a result of the reenactment, they're very interested in establishing a historic preservation commission in their own state. The Mormon church even went so far as to bring the trial team to Utah to uh, put the trial on for the Mormon Church, for Brigham Young and University of Utah. Not only that, but they videoed uh, the trial and the panel discussion afterward. And that alone reached, in their cable TV, 18 million people. We used this material to create curriculum that would hopefully um, expose high school and junior high students across all of Illinois to understand not only just the historical issues that the Mormons faced and Joseph Smith's use of habeas corpus, but more importantly, how those issues connected to today. The Joseph Smith case shows us how uh, bigotry has impacted our uh, community and whether or not due process was applied then and how it's applied now. The Alton case uh, showed us that perhaps race relations haven't evolved at all. We need to address that. Alton schools had been desegregated from 1872 to 1897. In 1897, the mayor of Alton and the city council decided to segregate the schools. They hastily built two schools for black children. The Alton black community 
decided to protest that en masse. Those cases were, but for the commission, lost in history. Scott Bibb was a, was a black man who had uh, school-aged children who had lived in an integrated environment in Alton, Illinois. And then suddenly, uh, after over 25 years of integration, the Alton uh, Town Council decided to segregate the schools. And Mr. S Mr. Bibb used the legal means available to him to sue and get his kids to be uh, admitted to the integrated school. It took over 11 years. It went to the Supreme Court five times. In 1908, the Illinois Supreme Court ruled in favor of Scott Bibb. Illinois became one of the earliest states to establish the proposition that children were equal that you couldn't segregate them by color or race. However, the city council of Alton refused to enact the, the court's mandate. The model for the program that we all worked together on was that we would present the panel discussion and the play in three different cities, in Alton, and then Springfield, Illinois, and in Chicago. It really has a huge impact. And so I think that uh, picking the right cases, uh, showing their relevance uh, then and today, you know, was really important uh, to kind of uh, spur a, a contemporary uh, dialogue about school integration and, and school funding and a whole range of issues that would not have taken place uh, without this particular program. The greatest impact that I would say is that, you know, Lewis and Clark named their um, uh, community center after Scott Bibb um, to commemorate what he had tried to do in sending his children to a desegregated school. I was doing a, a tour of the Scott Bibb Center with Alton police and firefighters, and the firefighters picked up on the idea that Scott Bibb was himself a firefighter. These African-American firefighters motioned me over and said, could we speak to you? And I said, sure. And they said, would you go back over that Alton school cases and Scott Bibb and that how, how did we not know about that? And I said, well, it's a part of all our histories now. A project was started to ask the clerks of the court to set up a committee or a, a group that would look at their cases and then make a, a report to the Historic Preservation Commission. The circuit clerk project is an outreach project to all 102 circuit clerks in all 102 Illinois counties. What we're asking the clerks to do is cooperate with their communities, their historical societies, their newspapers, identify cases that are legally significant or unique or are just so wacky that looking back people say, I never knew that. And we can hopefully use those for future productions in the History on Trial series, or we can use them for other educational purposes uh, throughout Illinois. I certainly like to see History on Trial continue because Illinois has a very rich political and judicial history. And the commission is a perfect vehicle for bringing this to life, and we've just scrape the tip of the iceberg. I am certain that there are many, many, many more cases that are yet to be um, unearthed and produced for the public. We believe that our Historic Preservation Commission is, is important in archiving the past and in preserving the assets and the history of our, of our system. But we also believe that there's a very strong educational uh, mission that must, uh, must be encouraged and, and developed uh, to reach our students throughout the state of Illinois, our young people, and our population in general. The Supreme Court uh, Commission is in a great position to educate people, so we want to continue to help them uh, with, with funds and any kind of support we can give. I support the work of the Commission because I think it's important to advance um, uh, civility in the courts, I think it's important to advance transparency in the courts. I think it's important to respect and honor our profession and our institutions. Since we're preserving, you know, the, the history of the judges and the lawyers in the state of Illinois, you know, you can help us by, you know, doing an oral history with us. You can help us by, you know, providing some uh, historical cases that you're aware of. 
You, know, you can help us by uh, providing us financial support. Uh, you know, there's many different ways that you can help the commission um, uh, complete its goals. We uh, spend a lot of time with uh, students, uh, grade school, high school, college, around the state of Illinois, because they're our future leaders. And how well they're taught now has a great deal to do with what kind of leaders they'll be in 10 or 20 or 30 years. Thank you to the justices and Governor Thompson, President Cullerton, and all of you who participated uh, in this. And John Lupton, you know, did yourself a, as always. And to the staff, thank you. Uh, it is my honor to move on to the presentation of the Layton Award. In 2009, the Supreme Court Historic Preservation Commission gave its inaugural George N. Layton Award to none other than George N. Layton. Uh, and at that time, Judge Layton was a young 96 years old. Uh, George N. Layton's remarkable life story does not easily lend itself to a short uh, biography. He was born to immigrants from Cape Verde, the Cape Verde Islands in 1912 uh, in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He attended school intermittently while working in cranberry fields with his family, eventually completing the sixth grade. Uh, beyond that, he educated himself well enough to win a college scholarship in 1935, which was subsequently withheld when they found out that he didn't have a high school diploma. Half of the scholarship, though, was agreed to if Layton could attain college admission. The other half was to be released after his college performance was evaluated. Well, not only did Judge Layton get accepted to Howard University, uh, but he graduated Phi Beta Kappa. After Howard, he attended Harvard Law School in two parts. The first was interrupted by his service in the Second World War. He distinguished himself in the military, earning honors and important appointments, and ended with the rank of captain. He excelled at Harvard and passed the Massachusetts Bar in 1946, and he moved to Chicago without knowing a soul in the city of Chicago. He became active in private practice and as a civil rights leader. In 1951, he advised an African-American couple that they could live, that they could live in Cicero by virtue of their lease. Well, this resulted in a riot, and Judge Layton was indicted for inciting a riot. Defended by none other than Thurgood Marshall himself, the charges were gratefully eventually dropped. In 1964, Alderman Burke, Mayor Richard J. Daley, asked Layton to run for the Circuit Court of Cook County, in which Layton, in his own words, says, this was tantamount to a guaranteed landslide victory. He served the Circuit Court with distinction and then on to the Appellate Court from 1969 to 1976. In 1975, President Gerald Ford nominated Layton to the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois and he remained there until his retirement in 1987. But retirement from the bench did not mean retirement from the law. He returned to the practice of law with the firm of Neal and Leroy, remaining in the firm until 2011. Sadly, Justice or Judge Layton passed away earlier in June at the age of 105. In 2005, New Bedford named its local post office after Layton. In 2012, the Cook County Criminal Courthouse at 26th in California was appropriately named after Judge Layton. And tonight, we give out our award after Layton. So it is my honor 
to present the 2018 recipient of the Honorable George N. Layton Award to the theater school of my proud alma mater, DePaul University. DePaul has produced all of the history on trial presentations in Chicago and in Springfield and in Alton, and they also traveled, as the video said, to Salt Lake City and Provo, Utah. These productions, while viewed by thousands in person, continue to reach people every day, especially students, via the internet. DePaul has written the courtroom scenes that educate how the court system operates, enlightens everyone as to its history and impact, and it entertains us while we learn, like a Scott Turow novel. The theater school was able to audition and cast roles that brought historical characters to life, some of whom were lost to history, but reborn through the efforts of DePaul. It is very fitting to give the 2018 George N. Layton Award to the theater school at DePaul University for their exceptional service to the legal community and exhibiting the qualities that personified Judge Layton's character and service. So I'd like to invite to the podium um, John Colbert, the Dean of the Theater School, um, Dean uh, Corinne, the Associate Dean of the Theater School, Shane Kelly, the Chair of Design and Technology, and uh, Sandy um, Shiner, the Director, to accept this award. If you could, come on up, please. We're going to make you put that around your mouth like an Olympic cap. It's like the Special Olympics, Justice Burke. I'm going to leave the deans up here, but uh, each of them will also get one of these. Dean, it's all yours. Thank you. On behalf of the theater school at DePaul University, I gratefully accept this award along with my colleagues. And uh, our opportunity to contribute to the commission's history on trial presentations has been rewarding for all of us at the theater school. But I must be honest. This is not a room that, as theater artists, we expected to be invited into. We're grateful to the individuals who invite us to be part of this project and who we work with closely on each of these presentations. That includes Justice Burke, Justice Garman, Justice Cunningham, Judge Cohen, John Lupton, Scott Zala, and members of the commission. They had the insight to see that our theatrical skills could be applied to the work of the commission. As members of the DePaul University community, these presentations are not only an exercise in our storytelling skills, but also a way of furthering the Vincentian mission of the university. And as I hear about the uh, George Layton, Justice Layton, and what he accomplished in his life, I see that there are even more connections to the, to the mission of DePaul. Um, at DePaul, we often refer to the Vincentian question from the writings of St. Vincent de Paul. That question is, what must be done? These presentations raise important issues about the treatment of the mentally ill, the protection of religious freedom, and the access to opportunity without restriction by race. These ask, question, ask our audiences questions, then the audience are composed of students, lawyers, citizens, and the question of what must be done to create a more just society and a more just legal system. What must I do? What must you do? And what must we do? With, this, with me this evening, we're already introduced, but I have uh, Dean Corrin, Shane Kelly, and Sandy Schinner, who actually made all these projects happen with their creativity and expertise and ability to apply um, the storytelling skills in theater to a context that is very different than the world in which we usually apply those skills. That's exciting for us, that's exciting for our students also to see how you can use storytelling 
to impact our world in multiple ways, not just the sort of conventional ways. So we're excited to be able to be, to be part of doing that. So we're honored for the theater school to receive the Honorable George N. Layton Justice Award, and we're privileged to be part of the work of the commission. Thank you very much, and good evening. Thank you. Before I give uh, appropriately Chief Justice Carmeier the last word, uh, we're going to have a benediction and I want to introduce uh, Archdeacon Sean W. Denny. Uh, it's fitting that uh, Archdeacon uh, Denny should be with us representing the Episcopal Diocese in Springfield. Uh, when the Supreme Court moved to Springfield from Vandalia in 1839, the Capitol building was not yet complete and the court held two terms, two terms in the Episcopal Church right here in Springfield. Like J.T. Wilson uh, earlier, Sean Denny is also a lawyer and a minister. He was licensed to practice in 1976 and he served for 26 years. I had the privilege of working with him uh, as a distinguished member of the Attorney General's office. He also served as a commissioner and as chair of the Executive Ethics Commission in Illinois. And in 1998, he was ordained a priest in the Episcopal Church and became Archdeacon in 2003, the position he currently held. So uh, Archdeacon uh, Denny, please come up and give us the benediction, and then the last word appropriately for this evening will be the Honorable Chief Justice Lloyd Carmeier. Thank you all for allowing me to MC this award ceremony tonight. It has been a tremendous, tremendous honor. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the source of truth, of justice, and of righteousness. And you inspire us to seek always these things. You give us times to reflect and rejoice on past achievements and the gifts passed on to us by those who have gone before. But you fill us with hope for the future. We give thanks for the law which forms and regulates the bounds of our common life. Give us wisdom as we seek to maintain, to develop, to refine, and to perfect it, that above all it may be and may be seen as a beacon of justice and a source of strength and solace. We give thanks for the Illinois Supreme Court and for those who have served it with dedication and dignity over the past two centuries give to this court and to all the courts of this state and of this land the spirit of wisdom and understanding that they may discern the truth and impartially and fairly administer the law for the benefit of all people. Bless and guide those who seek to serve in the law. Fill us with knowledge and integrity. Disturb us in the presence of injustice and enable in us actions that serve to strengthen the common weal. We ask all this for the sake of your love. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you, Archdeacon Denny. <clears throat> if I were all of you now, I'd probably get up and walk out. Church is over. <laughs> However, this is not quite the end of the program. On behalf of the Supreme Court of Illinois, I would like to again congratulate the uh, Theater School at DePaul University, thank John Lupton, his staff, and the Illinois Supreme Court Historic Preservation Commission for this wonderful evening of celebration and tribute, not only to the 200 years of justice in the state of Illinois, but in recognizing people that 
have done good things for all around. And a special thanks to Scott Turow for his words this evening. And my talk would have been a little shorter if he hadn't said a couple of things. But he said something about the difference in controversies that are coming before courts at this time. And I want to say, first of all, I, I enjoy lawyers. I like the company of lawyers and their friends. And so I really enjoyed the evening with all of you this evening. I enjoy the company of my fellow judges. And the difference that we receive and that we hear in controversies is not by choice of ours necessarily. It's by what is going on in the world today. And we take the cases not because they're easy, but because we must. I'm proud of my colleagues on the court who make their decisions. We make our decisions based on the law as we understand it. I've often said, and many times in the company of legislators that our branch of government, the judicial branch, is the one branch that really is still working the way it's supposed to, and I hope we can keep that going for another 200 years. So I thank you all for attending this evening, for supporting the event, for the work of the uh, commission, and I'll say good night and Godspeed from Mr. Lincoln's Prairie on your journey home.